Hi, Christina. Welcome to the Hormones in Harmony podcast. Hi, thank you so much for having me on the show. I'm so excited to be here. Me too. So yeah, I was just explaining that I've been following you for a while. I love your approach to health and wellness and nutrition. I think we've got a lot in common, so I'm excited to get to know you a little bit better. So why don't you start off by giving us a brief overview into your health history? And I know that it's pretty extensive and I actually listened to the podcast that you recorded and it's like, is it two hours? Yeah, <laughs> two hours long. It was so gripping and so amazing and I can relate to a lot of that. So definitely I'll link that in the show notes for everyone to go over and listen to the full story. But can you give us like a brief overview of the key points? Yeah. Well, first of all, thank you for listening to that podcast. I know it's a time investment and that podcast is actually interesting because it was almost, I mean, I was still kind of, I was still in it. Like a lot's happened even since then. I mean, it was almost like a verbal diary for me. I just needed to release all of that emotion. So I really appreciate anyone who listens to the whole thing. Yeah. It had to be on and off. It was probably over like three days, but I yeah. get it. I got that. Yeah. <laughs> I, I love it. Yeah. It's definitely not one that you listen in one, one swoop. No, no. Um, but to be as brief as I can, basically, I struggled with digestive issues pretty much my whole life growing up, just didn't really realize they were abnormal. And then I also struggled a lot with anxiety and depression starting in middle school through high school and college. In college, um, things kind of hit ahead. I had a really bad case of chronic mono at the end of high school. I was really, really depressed and unhappy in college. And that turned into a binge eating disorder. And I just decided, okay, I need to turn my health around. And so I decided to get healthy. I wanted to pull things together, cleaned up my diet, um, got really into quote health, you know, all over the internet, what, what the internet was, was saying and things improved. I, I was exercising, I was eating a lot cleaner, but my digestive issues were still really bad. So I just started seeing a bunch of different nutritionists, different doctors and specialists, anyone I could find. I mean, I was just kind of the mystery case and no one really told, could figure out what was going on. Um, and then I had sort of an, I had an episode, I would say, a trigger episode. I'm sure you are familiar with the idea of a trigger episode. Um, I had some froyo on, on a trip to San Diego for spring break. And I came back and I was just violently ill for a week. And after that, it was like my digestion kind of just stopped working. And I uh, cleaned up my diet even more. I cut out gluten and dairy. And that helped a lot with um, a bunch of different symptoms, but still my digestion was not just not working. I was in so much pain and I was losing weight, a combination of just cleaning up my health in general, but also my digestion was just not working. And I found out I had candida overgrowth eventually. And so I went on a candida protocol and that combined with everything that else that was going on, like severe malabsorption, I lost like 40, 50 pounds and a couple months. So I went from like 125 to 73 pounds in three months. Um, it was pretty drastic and I didn't really fully realize it while I was going through it. I had really bad body dysmorphia. You know, when you see yourself in the mirror every day, you just, it's such a, like, you don't notice, you know? Um, and this got really wrapped up in kind of my body image and I was getting a new type of attention from people. Um, some people were telling me I looked great. Others were telling me I looked super sick and I'm seeing different doctors and I was getting really scared because my digestion still wasn't working. I didn't know what was going on. All the doctors I saw told me I was lying, that I was anorexic. They tried to send me to an inpatient treatment center in another state. Um, and yeah, it was, it was really, it was a tough time. I dropped out of school. I was just seeing every specialist I could see in Los Angeles. Um, and I was just kind of the mystery case and I was doing every test under the sun and they told me they didn't know what's going on. Um, and I had cleared the candida. I was convinced I had SIBO and, uh, the doctors were telling me, some told me SIBO wasn't real. Others just wouldn't give me the test. Um, and I was still very much in the conventional Western medicine route. Um, and then, you know, I dove into my own research. I became convinced I had intestinal permeability, that I had SIBO, that I just needed to really heal my gut. Um, eventually, my nutritionist let me go paleo. She just really didn't want me to for a while because, you know, don't want me to cut more foods out of my diet because I'm losing weight. Um, and I was eating a lot of food and still dropping weight, which is what was really scary for me. Um, and then I went paleo and 
that allowed me to start healing my gut. And then I was started some supplements. I, after my research and my gut started healing, I also, I had been like, quote, misdiagnosed with hypothyroidism and a doctor had put me on thyroid meds, which also made me lose weight. <laughs> so going off of those meds helped a lot. Um, and then I slowly started putting on weight, I reached a stable weight, um, was able to go back to school. And then I started working for a health blogger. Um, and she connected me with her functional medicine doctor and he ran every test. He just validated everything I was saying and thinking. And he was like, no, you're not crazy. Like this t totally makes sense. Um, he ran every test and I found out I had small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Like I thought I had, um, a bunch of other bacterial overgrowths and then clear those up. And then over the following years, it was just kind of like recurring, recurring gut infections. I got candida again. I had that for over a year. I got SIBO again. I had other bacterial overgrowths and it was just one thing after another. Um, and it took a while. And then I eventually found out that I had three parasites, mold toxicity, heavy metals toxicity. Um, and that was what was causing the recurring bacterial infection. So it's kind of been over the last few years, like figuring that out, clearing things up. Um, and now here I am. Yeah, so that's a lot to take in. And it sounds like you've been, and you're only, how, how old are you currently? I'm 24. Okay. Yeah. So same as me. So you've been through quite a lot in a short period of time and obviously you're maybe not fully overcome all of your problems yet but I bet you're in a lot better better situation than you were um, even a couple of years ago so my question um like kind of disordered eating eating disorders even though you may not have had um that diagnosed or it wasn't really a problem but I'm curious um it's not really my area of spe speciality but would you say that a lot of the time that people who have eating disorders have some underlying gut problems that may be making make them more prone to restrict, if that makes sense. So is it the chicken or the egg? Is it the eating disorder that comes first and then the gut gets mess, messed up? Or do mm -hmm. you feel like there could be some bacterial overgrowth or parasites that's then making them change their food and try and control the symptoms? I think that there are definitely cases of both. I think that there, there are definitely people who struggle with eating disorders that don't have any gut issues or a health issue causing it. But I do think there is a big population of people who have eating disorders or disorder eating um, that is rooted in gut health issues. And that's why, you know, for me, it's such an emotional thing, like working with my clients, like they, it's a similar story over and over again. Their doctors are just telling them, they have an eating disorder or they have disordered eating and it's just this thing in their head. And what a doctor doesn't understand is if you are in severe pain after eating a t bunch of different foods and you're like in your body, you're in so much pain, you're so uncomfortable. Of course, it's natural to not want to eat that food. You know, you're trying to protect yourself. Um, and so it gets, it gets really tricky. And also with binge eating disorder, you know, I think my, when I had binge eating, I think that was a combination of like emotions I hadn't dealt with, but also physiological reasons. I think my candida drove that a lot, you know, because when I cleaned up my diet and when I got rid of my candida, I didn't, I did not have the urge to binge at all anymore. It was that, that sugar monster driving it. You know, when you have candida overgrowth, you're just craving the sugar. And so it gets really confusing, which is it. And I think oftentimes it's a combination of both. Um, but I, and, but not every case of eating disorder is rooted in a gut issue, for example. But I see this a lot with the clients who come to me with gut issues um, is that it, it kind of, it can kind of cause this disordered relationship with food. Um, and that's why oftentimes, I, I mean, I get a little frustrated in the disordered eating space when they try and pin it all on emotional issues. I think that's really important, obviously. Like, <laughs> but you have to get to the physiological issues as well. Like if somebody has a bacterial overgrowth, if they have candida, if they have SIBO, it's really hard for them to have complete food freedom, so to speak, right? Because it's like certain foods will make them really bloated and uncomfortable or in pain, or they might just be constantly thinking about sugar all day long if they have those, those bacteria who are just craving eating it, right? So I think, um, practitioners especially should be aware of that, um, especially mental health practitioners. I wish there was more education in that space about how these physiological issues can, can cause these different types of eating disorders or disordered eating. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, so interesting. And I agree that more information and education needs to be around this area. And Mm -hmm. sadly, the conventional approach to something like anorexia, you're false fed a lot of the time, whipped cream and cakes and biscuits, and the people are sometimes rejecting it. And sometimes because of the the eating disorder and the fear of gaining weight but sometimes it's because maybe they have a dairy sensitivity and a gluten intolerance so the mm-hmm. body is trying to protect itself um mm-hmm. so yeah there's a little tangent but um, i thought that was important and um good information for other people to hear as well if they're dealing with something similar yeah no i mean i'm really glad you brought it up because it's something i'm really i'm really passionate about because i mean i definitely had eating disorders. I didn't have anorexia, but I do work with a lot of clients with eating disorders. And I think they come to me because I'm one of the first people they've heard who helps people put on weight, you eating healthy foods. Um, because you know, when you're underweight, like let's say hypothalamic amenorrhea and your doctor says you just need to eat more food and gain weight. And they're just trying to shove food down you. That's a hormonal imbalance. And do you think that eating like processed cookies and ice cream just to put on weight is going to help your hormones? No, it's not. Mm -hmm. You know, and I was, I, you know, for me, like I was at such a low weight and my doctor just wanted me to eat food. And I was just adamant if I just eat crap, I am going to get worse. I'm going to feel horrible. And they didn't believe me that I could put on all the weight I needed to eating whole foods. And guess what? I did because when you give the body what it's designed to process, it balances out to where it needs to go. You know, like, it's a calorie can, you know, it can still, it's, if you increase your calories and you get to the root of the dysfunctions that your body can absorb and process all your nutrients, you can put on weight in a healthy way. And the problem is like with the typical approach is shoving whatever calories I can down somebody, that person is oftentimes going to end up with the opposite quote, opposite eating disorder that they started with. So this is why you see a lot of people who go, who go into treatment for anorexia coming out with binge eating disorder. Or they go in for uh, anorexia and they come out with bacterial overgrowth and hormonal imbalances, you know? So like, let's not, you know, trade one issue for another. Like, let's actually help somebody heal. So it's just a different approach. And it's something I I am really passionate about because I hate to see so many women really struggling um, through that process. And I just wish they were supported in a more holistic way. I totally agree with that. And I've covered hypothalamic amenorrhea on the podcast. So I'll link that in the show notes. But I had an expert in that area on. And she, again, was someone who was promoting, you need that 2,500 calories. That's all that's important. Get any food that you want in, whether it's pizza, pasta. Um, And I didn't have the same approach to that. So we kind of disagreed quite a lot throughout the episode, which was fun. Um, But yeah, her approach was just get the calories in and to intuitive eat once they've overcome hypothalamic amenorrhea to intuitive eat. And I agree that that sounds amazing and we should all be aiming for that. But for some people who have insulin resistance or candida or the leptin and ghrelin is like completely out of whack. They either have completely skewed perception of hunger and fullness signals so could you talk a bit more about that how um maybe some of those things and intuitive eating what are your thoughts yeah so i mean i definitely agree with you in the sense of yeah like the idea of intuitive eating is great and we should all aim for it so to speak but for that it's that's not that realistic for most people because most people (laughs) i'm sorry but most people have hormonal imbalances or gut issues uh, whether or not they know it and sometimes intuitive eating can lead people to undereat or overeat and you have to honor you have to honor that too so yeah i think intuitive eating is a great goal but i'm i'm really not a fan of this shaming that goes on in the intuitive eating space of people who you know have to follow a healing diet for instance or certain macronutrient ratios and it's like if you haven't lived in that person's body you can't judge them because for certain people if their macros aren't a certain way like they will have horrible symptoms and feel horrible and barely be able to function or same with you know with the healing diets like sometimes you sometimes you do have to eliminate certain foods that are causing your body to become inflamed or attack itself so that you can heal and feel better and i think everybody has to like honor their own journey and their own process and intuitive eating. I think people think intuitive eating is like, just eat whatever you want, but you could also interpret intuitive eating as like eating 
intuitively in terms of like, what does my body need right now? And what your body sometimes needs is a healing food or a healing diet. Um, and so intuitive eating is going to look different for different people at different times in their lives, you know, but maybe my version of intuitive eating, so to speak, is my, my head, my, I'm craving a brownie, right? Yeah. But intuitively, I know that I have a bacterial overgrowth. And so what's really going to nourish me is going to be some avocado and some grass fed meat and some nice veggies, right? Like that intuitively is what I know I need, even though my brain is telling me the other thing. Um, so that just, I think people people in the intuitive eating space who shame people who follow certain healing diets, for example, it's just really unfair for them to judge because if you haven't struggled with that health issue or haven't had that experience, you just don't know what it's like. And at the end of the day, the point of intuitive eating is that we all feel incom- is that we all feel comfortable in our bodies, right? So what's going to make me feel comfortable and happy and healthy and energetic might be different than what, what, the same for you. Right. So it's like, I mean, I see this with clients too, in their, in their food journeys, like some of my clients will talk about adding foods into their diet. And I'm like, absolutely not. Like you're not there yet. Like you, you know, you need to keep eating in this quote stricter way. Whereas other clients I have who they're just stuck to their healing diet. I'm like, you need to go out and like eat a cookie. Like, you know, like for you, that's what you need right now. And what people, everybody needs something different. So That's kind of my, those are kind of my thoughts on the intuitive eating space. Um, I think, you know, yeah, it's a great, it's great to aim for that, but most people aren't there and like, let's just do what, what works for you versus like what everyone else is trying to say you need to do. Yeah. There's even other practitioners and I've recently blocked quite a few practitioners on Instagram who are judging people who maybe eliminate gluten or dairy saying that, the scaremongering and everyone should be eating a diet that contains some of these things when, yeah, it's just not true. And even though the clients may be totally fine with that, um, for some people, they do require that for full healing as well. And Mm -hmm. on the subject of diets and things, what about calories as well? So calories in versus calories out. I think the communities have moved a little bit away from that, but there are still some people who believe that, especially like PTs, fitness influencers, um, I see that all they care about is calories. And if you're gaining weight or if you can't lose weight, then it's all due to calories. What about, what about that? What do you, what do you think? In terms of, like in terms of weight loss, weight gain? Either. Yeah. Both. Um, so in a closed system, of course, like in a closed system, yes, calories in versus calories out, but we're so complicated, right? So like the, the amount of calories where we burn also depends on the foods we eat. So you're going to burn more calories digesting, processing whole foods than you will a processed food. Okay. So that changes, that changes the calories in calories outside of things. There are things like meat, your non-exercise activity, thermogenesis, like, are you fidgeting throughout the day? Um, you know, how often do you move? That's going to affect the calories in calories outside of the equation. Um, there's also things like your, the functioning within your body. So for me, for example, like I was 70, three pounds eating 8,000, 9,000, 10,000 calories a day, and I'm still losing weight. That doesn't make sense. Okay. Um, why doesn't that make sense? Because my body wasn't digesting or absorbing any of my food. And this is kind of goes back to what we were talking about before. Whereas doctors, you know, will see a, a patient like this and say, so just eat more food. Well, it's not that simple for everybody because if their gut, if they have really bad leaky gut, Um, They can eat all the food in the world. They're not going to digest it and they're not going to put on weight. So what you have to do is allow the gut to heal, like help the gut heal. And then the body will be able to process the food. So if you're not processing everything that you're eating, that's not, you're not going to be able to put on weight either. And also like, you know, just hormones, hormones in general, like, um, in terms of weight and inflammation gets wrapped up in this, right? So if your cortisol is really high, if your body's inflamed, if you're eating a food you're intolerant to, this can all lead to inflammation. Your body can hold on to water weight. Um, same with like, you know, if you're eating more carbohydrates, maybe you're holding on to more water and that all affects quote weight. Um, so I think, yeah, like in a closed system, calories in versus calories out is true, but we don't live in a closed system. Like our bodies are so much more complicated than that. And so much more is, is going on. Um, and that's why food quality and just supporting the, the internal process of our body, supporting our hormones and our digestion is really what 
is going to get people to their weight loss goals. And like, you know, we look at even just things like probiotics, you know, people can lose weight just by taking a probiotic. Like that's pretty, that's pretty crazy. You know, like, um, like how much butyrate are you producing? Like short chain fatty acids in the gut, like all of that is affected by our gut flora. And even with the studies with like mice and when they, when they do like fecal matter transplants and they'll swap weights, like that's how much the health of your gut microbiome affects your weight. So I think it's just such, it's a really complicated question. And so if you're looking at somebody who was very healthy in general, then calories in versus calories out, um, might totally work for them, but there's a lot of people who that just, that's not gonna, that's not gonna work for you because your body is so much more complicated. And oftentimes in that case, you want to just throw that equation out the window and focus on your underlying health issues. Exactly. And I always say like when you're fully healthy, when everything's working in order, then your weight kind of regulates itself and Mm -hmm. calories do matter. Like if you're eating like sticks of butter all day long, then you probably will gain weight. But I think your hormones matter more. So I'm Mm -hmm. always trying to emphasize that as well. And I even did a post on this subject today about weight and people just saying that it's all about calories. And I said that, how can you explain the person who's eating 800 calories a day and is morbidly obese and cannot lose weight? Or the person Mm -hmm. who is eating a perfect diet but has to take steroids for medication use and gains three stone in a week mm-hmm. and if these are the things that are um the, the things that show that calories aren't the only equation but again we just need to break this myth and i think you did a good job of that so <laughs> thanks for that amazing explanation um, what i want to talk about next is your approach to diet diet currently and nutrition because you've tried a lot of different things. So, um, different diet experiments. What have you learned? Just if you could sum everything up, what's your current philosophy when it comes to diet? And what have you learned from all these different experiments? Um, yeah. So, I mean, I think the one thing that's always stayed constant and they really believe will always stay constant for me is I just, I believe in a paleo approach and I know people call it a diet, but I don't think of it as a diet. I think of it as a lifestyle and I'm just not really sure how you could argue with eating whole foods from the earth. Um, and I think some people, some people can add other foods that aren't strict like paleo into their, into their diets and feel great. But I think that's a really great starting template. Like I think if, I think if everybody ate a paleo diet, so many of our health issues would go away. So much of our obesity problems, our underlying health issues, health issues, hormone problems, gut issues would drastically improve. Right. And then other people could expand beyond that. But for me personally, like my body is definitely, you know, it it had a lot going on. I have autoimmune stuff going on. Like that's for me always going to be baseline and for all my clients going to be baseline. And then depending on where somebody's at, maybe we can add in things beyond a a paleo template. And that's what I think of a a paleo template. Um, I used to be very biased on the low carb side of things. Um, like the keto side of things and just through all my experiments, I definitely don't think that is ideal for everybody. I think that there's a time and a place for a lot of these different diets. Um, and I think it's really about cycling. I think overall, uh, what I believe to be optimal is cycling different macronutrient ratios, different foods into your diet, like always cycling things in. I think, um, there are certain things that work better for men than women. I think, you know, men can do better with fasting. Um, women don't do as well with fasting. Um, I think that some people, depending on their, their health status, their age or activity level, do better higher carb, others do better lower carb. Um, it just really depends on the individual and at the time in their life, uh, the time in their life. Um, and so I just think there's a time and a place for everything. And I think where people get into trouble is when they marry themselves to one macronutrient ratio and never want to switch it up. Um, so just in general, that's kind of, I think the body, the body also adapts always right so it's nice to switch things up and i think cycling different things in and out of the diet um are really are really helpful so that's kind of just an overview of my approach so basically paleo template which naturally is gonna be low carb compared to the rest of like you know the standard well I'm over here, standard American diet or yeah, like standard, exactly the same. Yeah, yeah, standard <laughs> England Western diet. Western like, diet. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, basically. So it's automatically going to be low carb, but then within that space, I think some people do better on 
you know, one to two to 300 grams of carbs and others do better on, you know, zero to 100 grams of carbs. Um, so I see a time and a place for keto. I see a time and a place for carnivore. I see a time and a place for, um, you know, like leaning vegan or vegetarian. I see a time and a place for, you know, leaning high carb, low fat. I just think it depends on the person. And I think evolutionarily as well, the cycling absolutely makes sense. We wouldn't have access to the same foods every single day. We wouldn't have access to a supermarket to go and get food whenever we want or the 24 hour store that's open. We can go and grab food whenever. There would have been times when we had no food and that we'd have to hunt and maybe eat the same thing three times a day for a month. Um, so I agree with the cycling as well, like seasonally, um, with your menstrual cycle, there's so many mm -hmm. cycles that you can work with, um, mm -hmm. just on the low carb approach as well. So you said that you shifted away from that. Why is that? Do you, do you find that maybe it stopped working or did you just want to experiment with a higher carb? Yeah. For like, for me personally, um, when I first changed my diet, I kind of went straight from like standard American hardcore diet like eating so many processed foods really high carb to like keto overnight like I just kind of went straight there so I never toyed around with like a higher carb paleo approach so part of me just always was like I don't even know what that would feel like and I think as a practitioner, it's really important for me to just try everything that I can and to have a personal experience at least. Um, and also I just felt like, you, you know, like I had definitely reached a stall and I feel like for me with my gut, it really was important for me to be eating lower carb at that time. And then I started learning more. Um, and you know, when you just reach a stall for so long, you can't just keep doing the same thing. Like you have to change it. If it's not working, like it needs to change. Right. Um, also some of the newer research on like hydrogen sulfide SIBO was super interesting to me. And, you know, SIBO typically people are put on a high fat, low carb diet. And with the hydrogen sulfide SIBO, what they were finding in, in the trials with Dr. Pimentel was that it, it, people were actually doing much better on a higher carb, lower fat diet. And I was like, interesting. Um, because that was always something I wondered if I, if I had, you know, there wasn't a test, um, but just because I did have like a, a sulfur sensitivity. So just, you know, thinking that in my head. And so I wanted to just try it out. Um, so, uh, and I think also in terms of hormones, like for example, in the context of my own life, my health issues had shifted. Like my, I, I had gotten over the gut stuff and now I was facing, okay, now I need to balance my hormones. You know, I, I had lost my period for four years. Um, and you know, high cortisol, no estrogen, like I needed to balance out my hormones. And as a woman, I'm like, okay, like my, my high fat, low carb did me good for a bit. My gut is clear. So like now I need to focus on my hormones. And I think what my hormones needed was a high shot of carbs and my body had been deprived of a lot of carbs for many moons, like many years. So I needed to switch and I got my period back, you know? So, um, and I think this whole experience in me shifting has been really important. I think it's really important to always challenge whatever your beliefs are. And I also really don't like how people in the health space get so dogmatic and they'll be like, keto is great for everybody. High carbs, great for everybody. Like there are so many different ways to skin a cat and everyone's so different. Um, and I, I think it was good for me as a practitioner because I used to definitely, swing every when I first started working with clients I definitely swung everybody more in the very low carb side of things um and I find this a lot with with practitioners I I see what they're doing what they're recommending and it's like everybody just does for their clients what works for them and I'm like whoa like I don't want to be that person who falls into that trap because I see it over and over again I'm like that person's just recommending this because it helped them you know, but you have to look at the client and they're not you and you can't just project your own experience onto the client. Um, and so I think having this whole experience myself has really helped me working with people realize like looking at every single person as an individual, not as just like, what would I do if it were me, you know, and seeing, you know, maybe this person has gut issues, but that person might actually do better on a high carb diet. Um, if stress is what is at the root of those gut issues versus like, is it really the bacteria that's the bigger issue here? So it's looking at all the different components that are at play. I'm sure you know, like with clients, um, a lot of people have gut issues and hormone imbalances and the stress, the lifestyle things. So it's looking at that person and thinking, okay, in the context of their life, what's going to serve them? You know, like if this type of, if this type of, is this type of diet going to relieve their stress overall, or is it going to add to it? Um, 
And I think just learning more, you know, seeing, I used to think that to get rid of candida or SIBO, you had to be so low carb. And then seeing so many people who weren't as low carb and just getting rid of it just fine, you know, open, opening my eyes. And I think it's really about as a practitioner or just anyone in general, making sure you are open to new information, things that go are that challenge your beliefs and welcoming that so that you learn and grow and don't get tied into just one approach. Yeah, you're always going to find something to back up your beliefs. If you search that meat causes cancer, there's going to be a ton of research there. If it cures cancer, then you're going to find it. So yeah, I agree with that. Try and I read books on veganism. Um, and although I don't agree with that, so I want to pick your brains and see what your um, approach to that is as well. But I try my best to listen to both sides and not, again, put my beliefs and what's worked for me on other clients I've definitely refrained from doing that as well because that's mm -hmm. important and even what worked for me now or has in the past will change like if I'm pregnant in the future then things may change or when I get older uh, we all require different things at different points of our life as well so I agree not to be too dogmatic and um, kind of give yourself this label and in this in this crowd um, it, it becomes like a religion for some people and that's a little bit scary um, so on the vegan subjects have you ever been vegan in all of these experiments and things that you've tried over the years to did you think that it maybe would improve your health or have you never kind of experimented with that so the only time I was vegan um <laughs> not really vegan was like a couple months ago when I did the potato, I did a potato diet experiment because someone came on my podcast and he had only eaten potatoes for a year. So I was like, I'm going to only eat potatoes for two weeks. Um, so I don't really, I mean, so technically, <laughs> it was, yeah, I mean, technically it was vegan, but like, I didn't really think of it like that. And like, I wasn't, I wasn't planning on doing it long term. It was more of just like, I wanted to try it. I tend to do that. Like, I've tried almost every diet for at least a short stint, you know, um, let's just see if it, how, like, how hard is it to cook this way? You know, like, how do I feel today? Um, I think potatoes will be pretty easy. Yeah. Potatoes are really easy. It was Save actually, a lot of time. Yeah. It was really fun. I had a lot of fun, but I was like, okay, I'm ready for some green, you know, when, when yeah. you're craving lettuce, you know, yeah. it's time, you know, it's time. Um, so that was the only time, um, that I was quote vegan and I was only two weeks. Right. But I do have a very firm belief about, you know, a vegan diet. And I think that a long-term completely vegan diet um, is not going to serve anybody. I think that's the one thing that's not, I would consider to be not a healthy diet. Like in the terms of, if, if we're talking about whole foods already, like within that world, um, I think there's a time and a place for everything. But a long term, like living your entire life vegan, I don't think that's going to serve everybody. You're not going to get all of the nutrients that you need. You're just not like impossible. Um, so, <laughs> like that's just I'm sorry. Like <laughs> not gonna happen. <laughs> yeah, it's, you know, it's just impossible. I think that that's not to say like go like eating a vegan diet cyclically, maybe like adding that in for some people can work great. Um, or you know, just in general, some people just feel better eating less animal products like maybe they're just having like meat a couple times a week or you know it, just, it could just be less and some people feel better like that but um I do think that the majority of people do better on a diet that has plenty of animal protein like just gonna be honest especially if you're in a healing phase um and I also I mean when we talk about veganism I'm talking about a whole foods based veganism like this fast food veganism no 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 um, but I also think, I mean, in this, if we're talking about like beans and legu like legumes and rice and, you know, if you're going to consume those, making sure they're properly prepared is really important. But I think a lot of people um, don't do well with those. You know, I think it depends where your health is at. Like if you're in a healing phase, I don't think that's going to serve you. Your body needs animal protein to repair and grow. Um, and so I think, I do think most people do better with um, animal protein in, in their diet, a good amount, I think more than most people consume. I don't know about you, but almost every single person who comes to me is not eating enough animal protein um, or just protein in general. Um, but that's not to say there's never a time and a place for a, a vegan diet. You know, it just depends on the person. But I think like long-term, like 
are you going to live your whole life like that? No, I don't think that's healthy. Mm -hmm. And yeah, definitely the protein thing is huge. And even though they may be getting some protein in there and say for breakfast, it's a handful of nuts. They'll be like, yeah, that's my protein. I'm like, no, No. it doesn't really count. Or like one egg. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. No. (laughs) And there's all those proteins in that. Like, oh my gosh. (laughs) I know it's, it's not enough. And like all this propaganda on Instagram, I don't even know what they're saying nowadays, but they're like, oh, there's as much protein in X amount of broccoli as there is in, in what, and I'm like, I think I forget what it's like. You have to get like four cups of quinoa to get yeah. the same amount of protein you mm-hmm. would get in like three ounces of meat or something like that. I don't yeah. know off the top of my head, but are you gonna eat four cups of quinoa? Like that's also that's way more calories. Um, and just like that's so much on your gut. Like that no one is eating the amount or when people do the broccoli to meat comparison, I just roll my eyes far into the back of my head. Um yeah. like, are you gonna eat like a hundred pounds of broccoli right now, you know? So, and even think, the like omega threes, they'll say, yeah, I'm getting my flaxseed oil, but I think I can't remember the exact conversion. It was like four bottles of flaxseed oil to like one piece of fish. I'm like, who is ever going to do that? Yeah. Well, the thing is, it's like even people who are eating plenty of animal protein, they're often still deficient in omega threes. Exactly. You know? Like me, if I didn't eat red meat, I would I'm, I'm still sometimes deficient in zinc. So I'd be like, mm-hmm. if I was vegan, I wouldn't even be alive right now. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And especially like with the gut issue so prevalent, a lot of people do better with less of these animal or less of these plants. Like they can cause digestive issues. Like fiber is not helping as many people as people like to believe. Um, and so you're just swinging, I don't know. Controversial. Yeah, it's controversial, <laughs> but it's just, it's true. Like yeah, people with really bad gut issues often just need less plants, you mm-hmm. know, and that doesn't mean it has to be forever, but oftentimes like they just reduce the volume and they feel much better. So eating too many vegetables, like people having these giant salads every single mm-hmm. meal, that's one of the most common mistakes I see people make with clients and um, on social media even. Um, What are some mistakes that maybe you felt you made in your health journey? And what are some mistakes that you see commonly women making with their health issues? Oh man, a lot. Well, first of all, I I think just in general, like speaking broadly, like hearing things on the internet and just like applying it to themselves without considering who that's meant to be for. And also remember that most of the health information that's being put out there um, has been, you know, it's from men studied. If they're talking about studies are usually on men. Um, and it's like, are you, first of all, are you a woman? Are you a woman who is in her reproductive years? Are you a postmenopausal woman? Are you stressed out? Like it's very different for women than men. And so I think, I think the fasting is a huge one. That's a huge one. And a lot of people say, I feel great on it. And I'm like, you know, awesome for now. But then in a few months when your hair is falling out and your period's all out of whack um, and you're binge eating at night, like we need to listen to this, you know, and people oftentimes don't connect, connect the fact that every stressor on the body is just a stressor. It's just a stressor. So for example, I'll have clients with skin issues, no digestive issues, no quote hormone issues, like their skin is just messed up. And, and I'm like, you need to stop fasting. Like why? How is that connected? Well, because your body's stressed out and it's, the way it's showing that stress is through your skin problem. Um, and adding in that other stressor is not helping you. For some people, that could be a beneficial stressor. But for you, it's just tipping your stress bucket too far in one direction. And we need to be reducing the stressor. So I think the fasting is a really common one. Um, like, And even if it does work for some women, it's like they'll... T- they'll try and make intermittent fasting their lives. And I'm like, but then it's not intermittent, you know, like, you know, like if you're gonna add in fasting, like make it actually intermittent, like just maybe a couple times a week or like, I, I, I personally am a bigger fan of doing a longer fast, like once a month or once a quarter, right. Rather than like an intermittent fast every day. I think that's, that's makes more sense in terms of evolution. Um, so that's one is the fasting. Um, I think also just going oftentimes too 
low carb for too long when they're in the reproductive years. Um, I think also, especially with the popularity of keto, people get caught in this low carb purgatory where they are low carb, but they're not eating enough fat. <laughs> um, so their body doesn't really have any fuel to go from and they start feeling like crap and they don't know why it's like because you're, you're in between you're not giving your body enough carbs to like be fueled but you're you're going low carb and you're not giving it enough fat to be fueled and a lot of women are especially are really afraid of using fat so you'll see them just drop the carbs and they're not increasing their fat um, it's just a starvation diet pretty much exactly <laughs> exactly but i mean and also what we we're talking about before a lot of women are afraid of protein like they're just afraid and what they think of is a lot of protein Sometimes the girls, they're like, I eat so much protein. Like, don't worry, I eat so much. And we, we find out how much we're eating. I'm like, you don't eat that much. <laughs> like, it's like 50 grams and you have this idea, you know, like eggs. This is a really interesting one. People are afraid of eating more eggs. And a lot of people are caught in this two egg trap. I'm like, minimum three to four, like minimum three to four. That's still not even that much protein. And I'm like, if you're eating three eggs, you got to add something else on top of it. Yeah. Um, so I think those are some, those are some pretty common ones for women that are, that are coming to mind. I've seen all of them regularly, um, with clients as well. Definitely. They are the common things these days, um, mm -hmm. because of all these like different people we hear. And then I agree, like not taking everyone's advice on board. Even, I always even say like, listening to my podcast, don't just do everything that I recommend like yeah. take, take someone's advice from somewhere else and then put it all together and, really make it around your life and personalize it to yourself mm -hmm. um and yeah with the fasting it's not like cavemen were planning on when they were going to eat when they were going to stop eating when they've had food that's not how it works it was much more sporadic and um yeah like once a day once a week you just go without food or you stop eating um mm -hmm. at 3 4 p.m and then go straight through till the next day if you feel that that works for you but again it doesn't work for everyone as well yeah so, 100%. Um, I've seen them all all the time as well. Um, but I'm just curious, who do you look up to and respect in the nutrition world? Because there's all of these experts and um, so many different specialists in all these different areas. But is there anyone who you feel like you really trust and respect and have maybe followed with some good success? Yeah, I mean, there are a lot of people I really trust and respect and I love getting information from, but I think, I really do think most people are biased in one direction. Like, you know, you kind of know like, oh, he's more keto, she, like she's really high car. Like I, a lot of people have this like kind of colored vision. Yeah. Um, the one person who I feel like is the most unbiased and also just gives amazing information is Chris Cresser for sure. So I feel like he's the yeah. one person who is just really open to all, all different ideas and actually looks at the data, but also doesn't only listen to the data. Um, so I feel like Chris Cresser pretty much is like, he knows what he's talking about. And I just love that he's not biased in one direction. You know, I don't associate Chris Cresser with being like, the high carb guy or the low carb guy or the, the no, the no grains, um, legumes guy, mm -hmm. or the, you know, like, I feel like he's pretty just covers everything and really understands how every, every person is different and looks at everything in a pretty unbiased way. So he's probably my favorite person to look, to look Mine to. Too. Yeah. And he's, he has been in like the paleo sphere, but mm -hmm. he absolutely says that he eats grains and legumes and lentils and things. Um, and his work is like scientifically backed. So yeah, I recommend everyone goes and checks his work out. Uh, he's not as active recently. I don't know if it's just me who's not been seeing any, any of his work. He's kind of on the, on the down low for a bit he must be coming out with something interesting <laughs> yeah well, I think he definitely kind of like changed his pace like you know I feel like he used to be someone yeah. in the space who was putting all the information and then he kind of switched to you know he's working a lot with like the health coaching side of things and mm -hmm. his book unconventional medicine I feel like now he's more focused on like spreading awareness on like the problem with our healthcare system and, like growing it that way and even within his own practice like you know he he's not I don't think he's seeing any patients like directly mm -hmm. anymore maybe he might be I'm not sure but um I'm pretty I know there was definitely a period of time where he wasn't but ever like the people he trained were seeing um so I think he's just like at a different stage in his career but regardless he still has so much information that's that's put out there um so yeah I still think he's my favorite person it's just it's hard to find people who are kind of who are unbiased you know 
Yeah, yeah. and his, his articles are like gold. He can mm-hmm. Google anything and then he's got something there that'll yeah. help you out. So he's always my number one go to as well. Um and on the subject of mistakes, health mistakes, what would you say to someone who feels like they're doing everything? So they're trying their absolute best to eat a perfect diet, they're exercising, they're taking supplements. What could possibly be going on and what maybe have they not looked into that you feel like could be important? I mean, well, I'd also, okay, first of all, I would get um, another opinion (laughs) because so many people tell me they've tried everything, they're doing everything right, and they come to me and I'm like, there's five things here that we need to change. (laughs) So there's, first of all, just always getting another opinion. Um, Sometimes we're just so stuck in our mindset and we just need an outside view. So that's one thing. Um, just because sometimes there are small diet tweaks that need to be made, or you know, there's a supplement shift that needs to be made, or with exercise. I mean, I mean that's kind of another common health mistake women make with their exercises. A lot of them are overtraining. Um, and but I definitely, I mean, that's what brought me into Reiki and the energy work is I think if you really are doing everything right, but you haven't worked on the balance of energy in your body, you haven't gotten into your emotions, work through any emotional trauma, um, any limiting beliefs, like what are your subconscious beliefs, what's what's going on in your brain, your self-talk, but just kind of these energetic imbalances in the body and done the energy work, then that's where, where I would definitely go. Because um, when we have energy blocks in the body, like emotional blocks, holding on to anything, and sometimes we don't even realize it, that will manifest physiologically. And that's been big in my practice because a lot of the, a lot of the clients that come to me are eating a squeaky clean paleo diet and taking all the right supplements and doing all the right things, but they still have this underlying stress. Like they still have this underlying stress and they don't know what it is. And so we got to dive deep and we got to like rebalance the other lifestyle factors, things that are going on in their bodies, rebalance their energy. And that's what gets some results. Like this is big for me, especially with my clients with, um, with amenorrhea. Um, and sometimes they're, they're just, they don't totally buy into my suggestions for getting their periods back. And I'm like, just trust me. And we always get it back, you know, because we're working on their sacral chakra. We're we're working on everything that can stimulate that. And sometimes that doesn't look like a food or a supplement. It looks like a lifestyle change. Um, or just works on rebalancing the energy. So I think definitely looking into energy work, um, any past traumas, emotional work, taking a deep dive there is really important. I think that if everyone started with the mindset piece, usually it's the last thing that ever gets addressed and it's commonly overlooked. If everyone started there, I think the results that they get, the improvements would be so much quicker and they'd feel a lot better and be able to maybe stick with the protocols and be able to, um, yeah, find some relief a lot quicker um Mm. but i'm intrigued what is your approach to the sacral chakra you kind of you've um made me a little bit intrigued there (laughs) yeah well so i mean the the big the big piece and i talk about this all the time i have a podcast about it but so your sacral chakra is connected to your reproductive system your sexuality, um, your passion, your, it could be creative passion, also family. Um, I just think of it as the passion chakra. And for a lot of the women I know who have amenorrhea, for instance, uh, don't have very active sex life. A lot of them don't date. They don't have sex. They don't orgasm. They're just really out of touch with that side of their themselves. So we work on that side of themselves and we get them watching 50 shades of gray and, having sex or going on dates, orgasming, like we work on all of those things. And sometimes it can be as simple as someone like makes out with someone and they get their period back. And other times, you know, um, they, they go on hinge, they just start dating, you know, they start dating and they get it back. Other times it's like being sexually active or it's people like shy away from it, you know, but like the masturbation talk, like I have this talk all the time with the girls in my program. It's like, you have to stimulate that for other women. They go and they get a, you know, the gynecologist and get a pap smear and their period comes back. It's just like, we got to figure out what's going to stimulate that for you, but also just sometimes just energetically get like getting comfortable with your sexuality. This is something I cover a lot. Um, like a lot of women have this resistance, like they feel shameful to like talk about sexuality or like really embrace it and just be comfortable with it. 
Um, and so getting comfortable with your sexuality looks, looks different for every person, but if we can get somebody to be comfortable with their sexuality, whatever way that takes, then that usually rebalances their energy in that chakra and their hormones start to balance out and they can get their periods back or whatever, whatever else is going on related to the reproductive system, it balances out. And can you give us some more examples of other kind of um, chakras and relating to other organs or like emotions yeah. and organs, those types of things? Yeah. So the other two most, most common ones, um, would be, so your solar plexus, um, is connected to your digestive system. Um, so a lot of my, one of my clients with gut issues, we're, we're working on the solar plexus and that's connected to your sense of self-confidence, autonomy, willpower, self-worth, like really your relationship with yourself. Um, and so it's really working on on that do you know who you are connected with who you are are you confident in yourself do you feel like you have autonomy um and it, when we when we work through the blocks there that often bounces out their digestive system this is like i most people know like you get bloated when you're stressed out or people who are it's like bloating i think a lot of people a lot of practitioners at least and are well aware of that it's like emotionally connected oftentimes you know it's like this relationship that people have they're stressed out and a lot of times that stress comes with from our relationship with ourselves um so when we when we get to the root of that when you get somebody to really step into their power um and it could be it's not always like self-confidence specifically it maybe it's the autonomy piece maybe that person is still living with somebody they don't feel like they're fully on their own yet they don't feel like they're completely able to be by themselves you know there's different aspects to it but it's all kind of related there so that's the solar plexus and the other common one in terms of health issues um would be your your throat chakra which is connected to the thyroid um so a lot of women with thyroid issues which i'm sure you see pretty common. Um, that's also connected to our, our self-expression. So expressing ourselves communication. So have you communicated everything that you need to communicate and has it all been communicated with you? Maybe it's someone who hasn't told you something. Maybe it's you, you haven't spoken your truth about something. It could also be expressing yourself creatively, just like any type of self-expression and speaking your truth, opening that up and getting it out there. And, um, a lot of, a lot of people with, thyroid issues often have something they need to speak their their truth about whether it be something from their childhood currently like they haven't fully said what they need to say and so sometimes that means talking to that person and getting it out sometimes it means writing that person a letter um just getting it out there sometimes it means visualizing talking to that person and really releasing that emotion so it doesn't always require talking to the person and dealing with it physically sometimes you can't maybe the person is gone you know but sometimes it does sometimes it means yeah you need to talk to your boyfriend and tell him that he's not treating you the way he needs to treat you and like getting it out there but when we get past that that communication barrier um then oftentimes the thyroid starts to rebalance out so interesting i love all of that woo woo i know it's yeah. like it is like scientifically backed isn't it like can you mm -hmm. talk about the people people are thinking oh my god like that's ridiculous how can something i'm thinking affect my body or how can energy affect my body what would you say to that yeah i mean this is it's it's science it's like if you believe in quantum physics you have to believe in energy everything is energy like everyone learns this in middle school, high school, right? Everything is vibrating energy, vibrating atoms, molecules. Um, and our, we are also energy and frequencies. Colors have frequencies. And there have been studies, I forgot the name of the book, but you know, there are studies done with water, for example, and water that's, that's blessed has a different molecular structure than water that isn't blessed or you've said hateful things to. So there's a more crystalline structure. Our words can literally change the energy, the frequencies around us. And also, I mean, I think everybody's had the experience of, have you ever walked into a room and been with negative people and you leave and you just feel crappy? And like, you're like, this is just bad energy. You know, you feel it in your body. That's, that's not you making that up. That's real energy that you're taking on and feeling. And um, with the Reiki, for example, you know, so Reiki energy is a healing energy and a Reiki practitioner acts as the channel of the energy. So like as a Reiki practitioner, um, I channel Reiki energy through my hands 
to the client and they receive that healing energy and it balances out the, the different parts of their body that need to be balanced. And if you measure the electromagnetic energy coming from my hands as a practitioner versus somebody who is not a practitioner, my, I, I will have more energy coming from my hands. Like this is measurable. You can Google there are studies. I just said someone one the other day. Um, so, and you can also measure in somebody's body, like before and after a Reiki session, the frequencies throughout their body, they change because they have been given different energy and rebalanced out. So, I mean, if you, and I think also like thinking about the research with EMFs, I feel like this is a big topic now that people are becoming well aware of like all of our technology, all these electronics are affecting us because of the EMF. So frequencies, energy affect our health. Um, and I know it's hard for people to realize like it can also be our own energy as humans, but just because you're not an iPhone doesn't mean you don't have energy. Um, it all, it's all at play here. And it's actually pretty powerful because I feel like it makes health more accessible to more people because the way you talk to yourself, the people you surround yourself with, like your thoughts can change the energy in your body, you know, and that can improve your health, you know? So it's like, in terms of cost, people feel like I can't do X, Y, and Z. Well, you have control over who, who you hang out with, how you talk to yourself, um, how you go about your day, like the energy you're surrounding yourself with, like you do have control over that. And I feel like it makes things more accessible. And like, even a really great documentary is Heal. Have you seen that? Yeah. Huh. Yeah. So like on Netflix, so anybody listening who hasn't seen Heal, like definitely watch that. And you know, there have been cases of people who retrain their brains to be able to get out of paralysis. Like, I'm sorry, you can't, you can't, like, what are you going to say to you that? You can't make that up. Yeah, you can't make that up, right? So, um, it, it's, it happens. And when you, when you really believe in that and like, you can take advantage of that and it can change your life. So, these are all things that I try and incorporate a lot with my clients, especially people with chronic illness, um, any type of chronic illness, autoimmune diseases who really feel like that's just their identity and that's what they're stuck in. And how much of that is what you're stuck in? How much of it is like, you know, if you shifted your energy, could things change? You know, if you shifted your self-talk, um, I, I think that people have a lot more power over their health than they give themselves credit for. And I think our brains can, can do a lot the way we talk and, and, you know, the way we wire our brains is really critical. And a lot of, we have stories that have been implanted in our heads from a young age. A lot of it subconscious, a lot of it is, you know, just from society and culture. And if we start to become more aware of, of those limiting beliefs and we change them, a lot of people would feel so much better. And thoughts really do become things. There's like a whole book on that. And if you're going about your day thinking of how unlucky you are, you've got no money, your health's getting worse, um, nobody likes you, then you're just going to keep attracting situations like that. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you go about your day positive, looking out for things to be grateful for, um, slight improvements with your health, obviously it's a process, but you can absolutely use your mind to your benefit when it comes to your healing journey and again that's another thing that's overlooked and a really good book on that is radical remission have you read that one i haven't but i've heard of it i yeah. need to read it yeah that's really good and i'll include the, the link to that and the heal documentary as well i think everyone should um check that out on it's netflix isn't it yeah cool so yeah i think we covered a wide um, variety of subjects there um do you, would you say that you're moving more towards um have you shifted from the nutrition um are you going to go back to that or are you just enjoying what you're doing currently i mean i th feel like i i mean i love nutrition i love geeking out over nutrition um but i do kind of feel like at some point like I feel like I kind of know, I mean, there's always going to be new things to find out. Right. But I think a lot of people get so wrapped up into it and there's so much more that's more interesting. And I'm definitely more interested in the energy side of things, the mindset side of things, just because I feel like it's so much more powerful. I think nutrition is super important. I'm always going to geek out over it and I'm always going to have, um, 
a lot of my work be focused around nutrition and health in general, but there's so much more to health than food. And that's a really important piece, but I'm definitely more passionate about, you know, like the Reiki side of my work and the energy side of my work, just because it, it applies to everybody. And, you know, not everybody has health issues, but everybody has things in their lives they want to work through. And this is something that can help everyone. And I just see now more than ever how important it is to work on every piece of the puzzle. And I know for me and a lot of my clients, they are just stuck in the mud, focusing on dialing their diet more and more and changing the supplements and they're not getting anywhere. Um, And I just feel like the mindset, the, the brain piece, the energy side of things gets people further once they have that nutrition foundation. So I think like when people are getting started, it's so important to get their nutrition in check um, and kind of like the more tangible aspects of health and then move into the deeper topics. So I think it's, it's something that's always going to be part of my, my work and I'm always going to love and I love geeking out over it and trying new things and reading random research and new books. But I think like my heart definitely is more on the Reiki side of things. Yeah, it's so interesting. And people think like adding in one extra serving of broccoli is going to be like the thing that completely changes their life and makes them better. But they could be eating like the best diet in the world. But if they're like mentally stuck or if they've got like trauma from the past, they're never going to like fully recover. So I think it's amazing what you're doing. So interesting. I love following along your kind of journey and learning from you as well, because this is something that I'm intrigued about. Um, But it's definitely like a whole nother another world even yeah. I get sick of like nutrition podcasts I used to binge listen to them every single day and I'm like nah <laughs> no me too like one or two and um I'm, I'm sick of hearing like all these different um contradicting thoughts and yeah I think you should yeah. stick with like three people and um just follow them and then get on with your life as well if you if this isn't your job like don't become obsessed with nutrition <laughs> I agree. And at some point it's just like, it's the same thing over and over again. Like everyone's just saying the same things over and over again in new ways. And even we look at diet trends and it's just the same stuff, like resurfacing, like, I don't know where this food combining thing came from all of a sudden food combining. I'm like, this was like a trend like 30 years ago and we're just (laughs) recycling. And I feel like, you know, keto's keto had its moment. I feel like high carb is going to come back in a second. Like we're just recycling and at some point it's like, I was the same way. I used to just all day listen to so many health podcasts. I don't really listen to any health podcasts anymore. Like I, I just, I'm like, I, you're talking about the same things over and over again and there's so much more to learn. So I think people get a little too stuck in that rabbit hole. Um, there's just so much more that's, that's interesting. So I, I agree. That's what I tell people to do too. I'm like, find a couple of people you like, follow along with them and then just leave everybody else to the curb. You're not going to miss out on anything. I promise. <laughs> Absolutely. We're like in this business. So if we're yeah. saying, if we're saying we're sick of it, then there's other, other things that people should be interested in as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. So just to finish up with a few questions, just so people can get to know you a little bit better. And um, the first one is what's something that you're into lately. So you've mentioned about Reiki. Is there anything else, any cool research or any new products you've got that you you've been enjoying anything I'm into lately um well I'm really into like non-toxic personal care stuff so I do a lot with like I work for beauty counter so I do a lot with non-toxic um beauty makeup skincare I'm super into that and also essential oils like I'm all about it and um I mean I used to like I've always been a huge like product junkie, makeup junkie. And so when I got into the health space, you know, I just kind of went into the non-toxic realm of things. I also like, that was the main reason why I had heavy metals toxicity from all my makeup. So Mm -hmm. I'm really into clean beauty and, um, like I geek out over like new beauty products. So like we just released counter time, our new like anti-aging line, which I'm obsessed with because we have like a non-toxic alternative to retinol, which is crazy and so cool. So I can get over that kind of stuff. And also like my essential oils, I'm like, I'm looking at them. I have like a million (laughs) essential oils and I like to just like make different blends. And like, there's an oil for everything. I tell people like, there's literally an oil for everything. Like I, I got some bug bites. So I was just like, um, making up my little concoction to help get rid of them. So those are two things that I'm super into. 
Yeah, I wish we could have Beauty Counter in the UK. It's not here yet. So hopefully, yeah, I, hope I always see people, yeah, like with the products. I'm like, oh my God, I really want that. But not yet. Hopefully in the future. But non toxic skincare is like so crucial as well. Mm-hmm. We actually had um, Laura Adler on the Environmental Toxins Nerd a couple of weeks ago. So um, I'll link to that episode as well. If people are like, what? My skincare products have heavy metals? Then, yeah, yeah sadly they do. But there'll be more information on that as well. Um, so next question is what's one herb nutrient or supplement you couldn't live without that I couldn't live without I mean does a probiotic count yeah of course yeah I need a probiotic like I just think it's just one thing that can help with so many different aspects of health um, for so many people that it's really important so and also with quality like this is something I'm super into is just the quality of probiotics so many people just go to the store and get one I would rather you not take a probiotic than take a crappy one. And most of them are crappy. And um, most of them don't have the strains that they say on the labels. Most of them don't make it alive into the intestines. They're not doing anything for you. So you're just wasting your money. So it's really important to get a high quality spore-based probiotic. um, And that can be a, a game changer just because a good probiotic, like healthy gut flora impacts your mood, it impacts your um, your cognitive abilities, it impacts your digestion, obviously, which is like your gut health is the key to overall health, your immunity. Um, it can impact your weight, your athletic performance, um, joint health, like everything. So I just feel like that is what I need. Probiotics and magnesium are like the number one answer whenever Mm -hmm. I ask this. So I agree that a lot of people who give these like obscure herbs, I'm like, uh, please everyone don't go and take, start going taking them because it may not be right for you. But probiotics especially um do you use megaspore is that the one that you're referring to yeah i yeah. I, I use megaspore just thrive yeah. probiotics so yeah. uh, megaspore is the practitioner version and then just mm-hmm. thrive is the one that's kind of available to everybody their sister probiotics so one of those is what i always go for yeah probably they're the only two that i really use in practice anymore like i've mm-hmm. th- there's like millions of different ones available but i'm like none of them have been more affected than those two so I completely agree with that as well um so third question what's your go-to breakfast my go-to breakfast is like leftovers <laughs> so um I usually have like uh like turkey or meat whatever I ate for dinner I have that and then whatever leftover vegetables so like this morning I had um this morning I had some ground turkey I had left over and some carrots and yellow squash and some spaghetti squash and avocado. Sounds good to me. Yeah. <laughs> and final question is, is there a book that has changed your life or like a resource or something you've watched that's been really impactful to your health or maybe career? Yeah, it's not necessarily like my health, but the book Big Magic by Elizabeth Gilbert is my favorite like my favorite book and it's really motivating um especially if you're a creative or but I feel like really for anybody who just like needs motivation like do their life's work like follow their purpose um like creating magic in the world you know but that's my favorite book whenever I just need to pick me up and it's so motivating and inspiring so I highly recommend that book amazing yeah I like that one too it's really good so finally, where can people find more about you online? What are you up to? Um, where can people work with you if they really want to? Yeah, so you can find everything from me at christinaricewellness.com. And on my website, I have um, I have all my blog posts. I have a ton of information on my blog, as well as a membership portion of my site. So you can pay a monthly subscription, cancel anytime. And that's where I put a lot of my content that I used to reserve just for clients. So it's kind of like level up. Um, I have a lot of my protocols on there. So just so that people can get access to help without working with me directly, because I don't see as many one-on-one clients anymore. Um, There's also a link to my services if you want to work with me one-on-one for nutrition, lifestyle, or Reiki. So I do in-person sessions in San Diego as well as distance sessions. So you can be from anywhere in the world and we can do a Reiki session. 
Um, so that's all my services page. And then I also have an online course called the Paleo Woman Lifestyle Program, which is a course that kind of just goes over everything that I think all women need to know to optimize their health. So we cover, you know, gut health and hormones and nutrition, balance plates, avoiding the top health mistakes women make, everything in between. Um, I used to run that as a group program. I don't run it as a group anymore. It's just online self-study DIY. So you can go through at your own pace, but that has so much information there. Um, and that's uh, all my stuff is there. And then also my podcast is called wellness realness. That's on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, all the, all the podcast places. And I have a ton of awesome interviews there. Um, like over 200. So you could get a lot of information <laughs> we've just been podcast. telling people not to listen to too many podcasts but I know. The exception. <laughs> yeah listen to mine um i mean i i like to bring on different people so not everybody i bring on i agree with i think that it's just anyone who's interesting um so it, it's a cool yeah and i cover things beyond nutrition too which is fun so that and then on instagram i am christina rice wellness great and you've got so much information they could spend a whole year probably looking through your stuff and learning a ton. So this episode has been so informative. I think it's going to help a lot of women um, dealing with the issues, whether that's mental, emotional, we've covered the diet aspect, stressors, we've kind of covered all of the important things. So thank you so much for joining me. Um, it's been great to connect with you um, and hope you have a good rest of your day. Thank you so much, Vivian. I had such a great time chatting with you.